And welcome to coverage of the Magic Online Championship. Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Luis Scott Vargas. Randy Bueller is in the red zone as well. We have an elimination match. Uh, we've got two more rounds to go as standard before we cut to our top four. And you see Dmitry Budakov there, our returning champion, playing against Ansi Alkio of Finland there, recently top eighted, in fact, top four, the Pro Tour. And looks like they're underway here. The loser of this match, though, is going to be eliminated from top four contention here. So this is a huge match. Remember, these players are playing for a lot of money, $25,000 for first prize here, along with a seat at the World Championship and next year's Magic Online Championship. It's a huge swing, and we are underway. Seder Wayfinder for Ansi Alkio put Seder Wayfinder, Night Howler, Gerard, and Grizzly Salvage in his yard here. And Ansi's looks like he's got an enabler heavy hand. He's got, you know, two more wayfinders and a commune. So he's mm. going to be filling his graveyard. And even if he doesn't find anything, Gerard's going to be able to keep coming back. Okay, so this is uh, this is the, we call it the dredge deck. It's a graveyard-based right. strategy for, for Ansi. Yeah, and Ansi might be regretting bringing it here. He, right now he's 0-2 so far with it. Okay. He came, in, he came in in second place. He had a pretty good, you know, lead on the rest of the field, except for Lars, of course. And so far, he's lost twice, and so he uh, both against Black Devotion decks. So at least he's switched the matchup now. Yeah. Now, what is he playing up against? What's Dimitri on here? So Dimitri's playing Esper, mm -hmm. and uh, he's going to kick things off by <laughs> <laughs> being happy enough to dissolve this lot left troll. Facing down two Seder Wayfinders, not the most aggressive yeah. start possible, but a lot of cards already. Nine cards in Ansi's uh, graveyard means, and there's going to be more here. Means that any if future. Uh, any sweet stuff in the future here for him as far as his uh, his enablers go are going to be very big. Yeah, and, and as we've seen you know, in every match so far, when the Esper player has a Jace on turn four, they're happy to counter almost anything on turn three. Yep. So Ansi did lead with the troll to play around Syncopate, but I wonder if he wishes he had led with the Wayfinder considering there was a Dissolve. Of course, Dimitri had the Syncopate also, so Dimitri ah. would have been happy either way. And actually it looks like Dimitri is choosing not to play Jace here. He, he, he's got the syncopate. He just doesn't want to get hit by a giant Night Howler. He doesn't know that Ansi doesn't have it. Right. And Ansi's graveyard right now looks like it's fully stocked with like eight or nine creatures in it. So it sure is. If he played a Jace and then immediately got Night Howlered, then he would be definitely on the losing side of the equation. Right. And th those Wayfinders can't even attack past that Muta Vault. Yeah, they cannot. Unfortunately for Ansi, he draws Sylvan Carry added, but he does have Commune with the Gods still sitting in his hand here. Again, he plays around Syncopate. Nicely, but make sure to play his land first. Commune's on the stack. It's going to get <laughs> negated, though. Yeah, Dimitri has one main deck negate, which is a nice little feature. And uh, he, he's actually, no, actually looking at it, he's ex exactly playing uh, Paulo Vitor's list from GP Buenos Aires. Oh, interesting. So, And PV did top eight that event. PV did. He had uh, one negate, one revoke in the main, and, and uh, one thought season. Dimitri has all those same cards. The old He's misers. even got the same mana base because, I mean, I, I looked at these lists so often that I actually, you know, remember what they look you like. Just and snapshot it. It's the two godless shrines that uh, <laughs> uh, flew me in. So. Right. So Dimitri's, uh, you know, he's got the one main neck negate, and you're, you're happy enough to snap it off on a commune there. You're not getting better than that. All right. Shadowborn Demon here for Ansi is what he's drawn for the turn. Right now he's on the Seder Wayfinder beatdown plan. Yeah, I mean, you might as well get in there. I he's mean, he does have Dimitri down to 14, but it doesn't feel like a good long-term <laughs> oh, He, he has him already at 14? Well, he's practically dead. <laughs> <laughs> Look, when all you've done is play Commune with the Gods and Seder Wayfinders, <laughs> getting in for six is well, pretty I mean, nice. So, sometimes that your draft doesn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> well, it started well. Yeah. <laughs> he had the triple and save so Wayfinder. Shadowborn Demon <laughs> demands tribute there. It actually it does. has to eat something, so yep. it eats, eats a Seder Wayfinder. Dimitri is... Letting that resolve in order to cast a revelation for two. So uh, now here, he, he, this is kind of interesting. Does he play around the the Night Howler and keep leaving Syncopate Man up? He's getting to the point where it's going to be hard to Syncopate a Night Howler if he does anything. Mm -hmm. And he can't just sit here and get beat on by uh, the Shadowborn Demon. I mean, which at this point no longer uh, is, is getting too hungry. There's enough cards in Ansi's graveyard. Ah, right. I didn't know that ever actually happened. Yeah, every now and then it does. Let's take a look at uh, Shadowborn Demon here. When it enters a battlefield, you destroy a non-demon creature, but at the beginning of your upkeep, if there are fewer than six creature cards in your graveyard, you sack a creature, but he, uh, he has more than that. Unfortunately, Shadowborn Demon just got gobbled up by a detention sphere. And at this point, I think, you know, Budokov has, has kind of resigned himself to, if, a, if Ansi's got a Night Howler, it might have just have to resolve. Okay. All right, so Gerard... 
Back into the hand here, and Ansi has a 10-10 Gerard ready to go now. And playing around syncopate once again. So Dimitri can, in fact, get rid of Gerard if he wants. He can play Elspeth and minus it. He can also play Elspeth and plus it, since at this point, he's uh, Ansi doesn't have a way to get around that. Right. Ansi could, could play a Herald of Torment, though. That is something that uh, Dimitri is going to have to worry about. So he's he's choosing to play very conservatively here. He's not putting himself vulnerable to almost anything. He's killing the Gerard, even though he knows his Elspeth's going to die. Right. Wow. And, and there's Nightcrawler. He, he drew the card. So Dimitri gets to feel smart. Meanwhile, he takes 10 damage here, while the other Sadie Wayfinder takes out Elspeth. And Dimitri could be in some serious trouble here. Remember, Gerard's still hanging out in the graveyard down here as well. Yeah, and... And even if Seder Wayfinder gets dealt with, Night Helder still sits in play. So Dimitri's got you know got himself into a, a bit of trouble. He, it's kind of funny the way this developed is he played he tried to play around Night Helder by leaving man up and not doing things. Right. And eventually that led him to having to tap out, and then he got Night Helder. And then he got Night Helder. And it turned out honestly he didn't have it in the beginning, yes. but then drew it in the end. <laughs> it drew it so exactly. It, it just the way things worked out were just not good for Dimitri. He's not dead yet by any stretch. He gets to chump with Mutavolt. Jace negates the attack by the other Wayfinder. And then he can play an Aetherling, which then just blocks the Night Howler all day. Okay. Or the Night Howlered up Wayfinder, that is. Now, how does Gerard work into the plan here? I mean, remember, Budakov's at four. So, Ansi can play a Gerard here. He's going to put himself down to just two lands in play. Uh huh. If he does that. Then he gets to untap, and if he has any mana, he can throw the Wayfinder the, He doesn't actually have enough mana to play at all, actually, because Gerard right. actually costs two to bring back as well. Right, so, so I've said if he draws a land. So yeah, at this point, Ansi's going to... Maybe he, maybe he plays some mana creatures and then tries to bring back Gerard, but that that's a that's a bit risky. So okay. I, I think that Gerard, you know, he, he enacts a heavy price. He comes out of the graveyard for free, or rather, you get to put him there and draw him, but, you know, he does require a lot of lands to get going. Right. And this is, this is like a 20-land deck, so... Yeah, it's not. It's exa exactly 20 lands, so there aren't very many times where you can do this. Here's Commune with the Gods, though, for Ansi. He finds another Night Howler. Which he can't cast right now, and because Supreme Verdict still is not that effective against a bestowed creature, right. I wouldn't be surprised if Ansi played one of his mana creatures here. It seems hard to get around doing that. He does. He's going to play Sylvan Carry added. Dmitry Budikov has Syncopate Aetherling in his hand, plus a land, and now he's also got a Doomblade. That Doomblade was big, yeah. so he's, he's going to have to kick things off by minusing Jace, I think, because he can play Aetherling, and he can Doomblade, because he knows the second Night Howler is coming. Ooh. Revoke existence There's the big. Miser's Revoke existence. Yeah, Revoke is, is quite nice in this matchup. So I think we're on a new plan now. The problem is you, you can't play Aetherling and leave up Doomblade, and you know you're getting attacked by two Night Howlers next turn. Mm -hmm. So you definitely take the Revoke. You Revoke Night Howler. You have Mutavault up. You can also then Doomblade whatever Night Howler goes on. Next turn, play Aetherling and have an Aetherling back to block. Ansi's getting to the point where now that he's played the Karyatid, he can draw land. If he drew a land, he could have played Jared this turn. But Ooh, there's a Deathrite Shaman, too. Yeah, Deathrite's actually going to be a good threat. Dimitri's at four life. Right. And here's Night Howler. And it's it's going to get syncopated. It's just going to get syncopated here. Yep. So that 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 death right is is was actually a good draw. It it's, was. It's going to pressure uh, Dimitri to do something here because it's 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 a two turn clock. Unfortunately for Ansi, the the Seder Wayfinders can't attack past Mutavolt all that well. He and Jace is at three, so he could attack both at Jace. One dies, and then uh, Jace goes to two. Then if Dimitri wants to minus Jace, Jace dies. So trading, trading a Wayfinder for a point at Jace actually seems reasonable here. Yeah, I mean, those Wayfinders aren't getting any better as we move forward here, right? No. So he does that. Mutavault jumps in the way. Of course, Dimitri's essentially tapped out at this point as well. So here comes Deathrite Shaman. Yeah, you definitely got to play the Deathrite here. That's the one that's going to be a lot more important. Deathrite not seeing that much play in, in standard. I guess uh, a little too much play in modern because <laughs> he got banned. Yeah, that was a good, it was a good one. Yeah. So, so Jace goes away. And these don't help. I mean, maybe down the line, but two-turn clock here. Yeah, th I think Dimitri's going to have to take a pile with Jace in it. Obviously, if it's Jace Elspeth, you take that one. But if it's Jace Jace versus Elspeth, I think he's got to take the Jaces. I mean, he's got to find an answer to Deathrite Shaman. He's, he's dead very quickly here. So he takes the Jaces. You do, I think, you could play Aetherling here. But it doesn't actually stop much. The Mutavolt's already stopping the Wayfinder, so I think you're just minusing Jace looking for... That. Yeah, looking for all this goodness. Supreme Verdict. Which he can also cast. Yeah, he can just take the Verdict and just and just immediately nuke everything if he wants to. 
That doesn't seem unreasonable. I mean, it, that also means that Jared doesn't get cast. So yeah, it looks right. like he's just going to do that. Yeah, you're you're hitting a mana source as well as a win condition. And I think that because Dimitri has Aetherling in hand, he already has an expensive card that's going to win him the game. He doesn't need the Revelation. I mean, Revelation would be better than Aetherling, but yeah. I still don't think he can afford to to just take two expensive cards and not cast a verdict that turn. Are we going to see Gerard now? Well, it looks like it. I mean, the Ansi doesn't have anything else in hand, so right. it looks like Gerard's coming back. He can't. Yeah, he looks like he can, he's going to run it out there. Gerard's a fourteen. Excuse me, a fourteen fourteen currently. Yeah, so it looks like Jace found another supreme verdict. So now Ansi, he he's pay, again paying the price for the, the the power that Gerard gets you is a, you know a card coming out of your graveyard that you never had to draw. Right. But he, Ansi's done three lands and no yes, cards in hand. No cards in hand. So. Dmitry Budikov looks to be in the driver's seat. It got a little sketchy there. Yeah, it was, it was a very, very close game. I mean, Ansi was just a few creatures short of killing Dmitry the turn he played Night Howler. Dmitry had to, you know, flip multiple verdicts, but he did. And now, even though Ansi drew a Nemesis Immortals that he can cast for two mana. Yeah, he's got the old goif here. <laughs> yeah, Dmitry can just Doomblade it if he wants. He can also uh, play an Aetherling. I imagine that you're just going to Doomblade that just to get it off the board, just because you're going to want to tap it down for Aetherling to try to end the game. So, given that Ansi has no cards in hand, you can actually even attack with Mutavolt you, if you want. I mean, they're not that. I guess you don't want to get Deathrite Shaman. You could potentially lose to a top deck Deathrite Shaman mm -hmm. that way. Unfortunately for Ansi, he draws a five drop uh, demon there. And one of the few cards in his deck that costs more than three mana. I mean, he, he's got yes. most, of the, most of the cards, like Night Howler and Herald, bestow for more, but they cost a you know, very low amount of mana. And he's got the one whip of Erebos and the two demons, and everything else costs you know, less, except for, of course, the, the last Jared as well. Yeah, it looks like we're getting pretty close to, to wrapping this up in, in game one here, since even though Aetherling's already you know, very close to lethal, Sphinx's Revelation is going to take the game completely out of reach. Dimitri flickering out Aetherling just in case. Yep. Here's Lotleth Troll. Yeah, Auntie's got two options here. One is to play Lotleth Troll. The other is to move on to game two. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like he chose the second one. <laughs> he, he, did, he, he was on the plan at first, tapped his mana, and then, and then moved right along. Yeah, that, that's the play I would have made. <laughs> All right, so players move into the sideboard portion of our show here. And... Dimitri actually has a more relevant sideboard than many of the Esper decks do, just because he's got a couple pairs of dark betray a couple dark betrayals, which can actually, you know, kill Lotleth Troll if it's tapped out, or a Night Howler or a Herald that's been cast. He also mm -hmm. has Revoke he also has Revoke Existence, which is one of the better ways to fight the bestow creatures in this format. Take a look at Ansi there. Carefully contemplating something on his fingernail while he, uh, <laughs> he goes he, through his sideboard options. He, he knows how to sideboard here. He's not too worried. Yeah. <laughs> There's the machine. <laughs> Randy, what do you got going over there in the uh, in the red zone? Yeah, nothing's done yet, but uh, a couple of super close, super important, interesting matches going on. Lars Dom versus Corey Lack. Corey can actually clinch if he wins this game, uh, but he's now down a game to Lars Dom. And then the other match I'm following closely is uh, Tomas Gleed versus Seth Manfield, where Tomas can sort of kind of almost clinch depending on other results. However, Seth, Seth hasn't lost yet today. He is 5-0 on the day, and they're embroiled in sort of a long, complicated game one right now. It's uh, Esper versus uh, Black Devotion deck, and it's been going quite a while and back and forth and still anybody's game. Okay. The longer it goes, the more likely Esper just draws a revelation and just ends the game on the spot. Yep. Man, Lars is really dominating this event at this point. He, he really is. Let's see if players are ready. Not quite. If I had to guess, it would be Dimitri, who's not quite done boarding, since Ansi has, uh, you know, uh, it looks like a more a more streamlined deck and, and one that's a little easier to sideboard. So uh, it looks like we are going to go ahead and take a look, whereas uh, Ansi's kicking things off with, again, the Wayfinder. You know, a solid five points of damage plus a Night Howler damage. <laughs> so Ansi gets Thought Seizes and Mist Cutter Hydras are the main, the main things he gets post-board here. So Budakov does not have black mana, it looks like, which 
But that's not going to hurt him too badly because he has the double Supreme Verdict, and Supreme Verdict is one of the better cards in this matchup. Even though the Bestow Creatures survive Verdict, mm -hmm. it's still pretty important to just wipe the board of all the 1-1s. One -ones. If the 1-1s one -ones aren't in play, at least you don't get hit by a Hasted Creature. Right. And there are only so many times Ansi can reload through Verdict here. He also drew Jared, which is not generally what you want. You'd rather just dump it in the graveyard and get it back later. Okay. It's kind of a free card that way. Ansi, pretty deep in the tank, just taking a detention sphere here, it looks like. And finding a forest off the second Wayfinder. I mean, this is kind of going according to plan. I, I don't think Ansi was too worried about his two Wayfinders getting detention sphered, but uh, other than that, I think he... I mean, he's attacking. He's going to get to bestow a Night Howler potentially here, and he knows that uh, Dimitri did not have that much that could answer it. So unless Dimitri's drawn like a syncopate or a dissolve, which it appears he has not, this is a pretty strong open. But it looks like Dimitri drew a revoke existence instead. Jeez. Oh, he he doesn't have he didn't have another land. So, you know, he he's he's now missing land drops, but which is which is pretty tough to come back from. But revoke is, you know, is one of your best cards in this matchup. Meanwhile, Seder Wayfinder beatdown plan again enacted here. Dimitri's down to 13, and Gerard's a 4-4. So a land now for Dimitri. It is a temple, though, so it's going to enter the battlefield tapped. And there's a Pithy Needle, which is well, going to name Gerard, I'm assuming, here. That seems like it is the most likely scenario, especially since you can then Dark Betrayal it or something. And Dimitri is getting hit. I mean, this is a 4-4, Gerard. It's not a 11-11. You know, right. But it gets out of hand pretty quickly. You know, Ansi's got two cards left. Ansi doesn't have a ton else right now, but Dimitri is going to need to, you know, survive this hit and then cast Verdict. I, say, I, think, I assume he's naming Gerard, yeah. It looks like he's shutting down Gerard because he's going to plan on casting Verdict next turn. Ansi knows it's coming and needs to peel a Thoughtseize here. Though a Bestow Creature would also do pretty well. It would. He finds Grizzly Salvage, which can grow Gerard and maybe even find a Bestow Creature here as well. Instead, he finds Lotleth Troll. Which is actually really good. I mean, it's, it's a lot less impressive when it's not, you know, a 10-10, but it's still regenerating threat that's going to survive past Wrath. <laughs> so, Dimitri's at 6. He's... He probably still has to Wrath here, and then he gets hit down to four by the troll. If Ansi draws anything, I mean, drawing the drawing the, the land was really good there, because Elspeth can at least kind of blunt the damage the troll does, but it does have Trample. It does have Trample, so things can get out of hand pretty quickly. There's Supreme Verdict prompting the regeneration of Lotleth Troll. So th this is kind of Ansi's game here. He didn't draw a creature or, you know, anything, anything Nothing. to make this troll better. So he's... He's got uh, Dimitri down to four. He's really hoping Dimitri does not just play Elspeth here. But even if even if Dimitri does, Night Howler's still good. Oh, yeah. Night Howler, I think, still ends the game right. just about regardless of what, of what happens here. Right now, Dimitri's on Dark Betrayal. He can use it to just tap the Lotleth Troll every turn. Ah, uh, right. That's true. <laughs> this We might actually see a really weird Aetherling plus land split here because the two lands are by far the most valuable cards. Uh. Problem is just it's just so rough giving, <laughs> giving away an Aetherling and a land. If you split it to lands and, and Aetherling, Dimitri's just going to snap the lands off. There's no way he doesn't take the lands. But, it, you, I mean, there's just no good solution there. So at this point, Dimitri has the option of just paying one black to tap Lotleth Troll and to tap one of Ansi's lands. Yeah, Ansi finds another Lotleth Troll here. Is Ansi going to attack Jace or Dimitri? It uh, looks like Jace, Jace yeah. which I, I think makes sense. So Dimitri really has to decide. I mean... The Dark Betrayal is going to be good later, but he's going to get extra activations off Jace if he just waits. He, and finding Detention Sphere is very important here. So Especially if he knew what Ansi had in his hand. Basically, Dark Betrayal is a zero mana Jace activation, a Jace minus two. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's trading it for. He's using a mana of the turn. He's not going to have used mana otherwise. Yeah. And At Ansi, the beginning of your next main phase. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and Ansi is just running it out there. He's, he's playing the troll. He's hoping that Dimitri does not find Detention Sphere. And it looks like Dimitri's not concerned about these trolls. He's just plussing Jace and then just playing. It looks like playing an Elspeth. No, he's playing a Revelation. He played the seventh untapped land. Okay. I like the Revelation a lot better. I mean, this gives Ansi a turn to draw Night Howler, which Ansi does not. And if Ansi, if Ansi had, I mean, I, I assume Dimitri would, would have been dead. But now Dimitri gets to look at four cards, 
plus potentially more off Jace if Auntie doesn't attack the Jace. And then if he finds a detention sphere, this game is almost over. Right. Because he's got the second revelation in hand. He just needs breathing room to cast them, and then he can just bury Ansi and card advantage. Remember, we are watching an elimination match here. Uh, if Dmitry Budikov is able to win this, he's still live potentially for a top four finish here, which is what our cut is. We're going to be cutting at the end of the day and playing our top four tomorrow on Sunday. Uh, Ansi Alkio up against it here. He keeps drawing lands. He's got two Lotleth trolls that he's hoping are going to take him to the next match, which is going to get him a chance to make it to the top four. If not, it's going to be Budakov. Yeah, and I, I don't think that uh, Ansi is in really good shape here or, or, or even, like, playable shape at all. I mean, right. Dimitri found the detention sphere, but honestly, given that those trolls are getting mostly stopped by Jace, there's not much that, that he could miss on. He, almost anything does something here. Yep. And even if he missed, he could just cast a revelation for a million. Now, Ansi can't really, you know, has no threats in play. Syncopate's going to make it tough to resolve anything big at all, and the second revelation is really just going to put the fi final nail in his coffin here. That's right. Here's Commune with the Gods, though, for Ansi. That was his draw for the turn. He finds Mistcutter Hydra. Mistcutter Hydra's nice. I mean, Mistcutter Hydra is, is, is a card that, you know, that does things. That, that's, that's a bit of action here. He can play a land, and he can play a 6-6 six, six Mistcutter, which is actually almost enough. I mean, Mutavolt can chump, and, right. and Dimitri can cast a revelation, and there's a Jace there, but Mistcutter is <laughs> at least something. <laughs> it is something. <laughs> that list got kind of long. <laughs> yeah, the list was not as not as short as Ansi would have hoped. All right, Miss Cutter, gonna get chumped by Mutavault here. I think Dimitri is taking the opportunity to chump while the Hydra is still blockable because it is possible that Ansi draws Herald of Torment, and you know that is something that Dimitri's worried about. Though Dimitri can just play an Elspeth and minus it. I mean, he's got that option too. Zero cards in hand for Ansi Alkio, so Dmitry Budakov working with perfect information as far as that goes, so he just needs to plan out how he thinks is best going to get him to the finish line. It looks like he's opted for an Elspeth. Yeah, he, he, he took the Jace plus the Temple of Silence off the Jace because he already had an Elspeth. <laughs> he's Elspeth flooded. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he is going to minus. That gets rid of... The Miscutter Hydra, he passes a turn back, and can Ansi find some way to apply pressure? A second Miscutter Hydra would, would smash for seven, but that just won't be enough. And I mean, unfortunately, it's a Thought Seize, which normally would be pretty good against Esper, but with that many cards in hand and with such a dominating board presence, Thought Seize just isn't what he was looking for here. And, and now that Dimitri has Elspeth tokens, he's not dying to a miracle Miscutter Hydra. Right. That was, that was Ansi's next best hope. Right. And now Jace gets to get active here. Supreme Verdict. Goes into hand for Dimitri, even though he's ahead on the board right now. Yeah, and and e even though the dredge deck is capable of some explosive draws, when you have no creatures in play, the deck doesn't have a, a ton going on. I mean, a whip of Erebus can be pretty good. You can just like bring back a miscutter hydra or something. But other than that, there's not much else you can do. You can bring back miscutter hydra, <laughs> Louis. <laughs> <laughs> it's a powerful card. Are you just checking in on me here? <laughs> well, you you look like you're a little tired, so I am a little sleepy, but not that sleepy. <laughs> You have to get up earlier than 9.30 to, to get one over on Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so more lands here for Ansi. He finds Gerard here. Which is, you know, at least large. Does that give him an out? But like it, next turn, play something huge? But it's still, it? it's still needled, so ah, right. th th that activated ability isn't happening. I mean, Gerard comes in as a 10-10, but yeah. Elspeth deals with 10-10s in many different ways. Basically, as long as Dimitri doesn't, you know leave himself vulnerable to a top deck Herald of Torment or Miscutter Hydra, which I really can't see a way for him to do so. Right. He's going to win this game, and okay. he's going to win it very quickly. Yeah, he just uh, used um, Dark Betrayal to take down Gerard and enter the red zone here with a bunch of soldiers. And this one's going to get closed out. It's funny that you mentioned turn. the red zone, because I think we'll be going there shortly. Yes, we probably will. I see uh, Randy furiously taking notes over there, getting some sweet matches lined up for us as it seems like Dmitry Budakov is going to stay potentially live for top eight contention <laughs> and knock Ansi Alkio out. Wow, he he's draws a Night Howler, too. Yeah, he's bestowing it on a soldier token. Oh, is he? <laughs> <laughs> for value. Yeah. <laughs> Making a 10-10 soldier, so. And he's going to scoop. And that's going to do it. So Dim Dmitry Budakov is our winner of our feature match here for this round. We've got one more round of standard. Ansi's going to have to settle for a, a money finish here. All 
everybody here gets at least four thousand dollars, but there's some pretty nice pay jumps in the middle. Does that include us or? Uh, <laughs> when I said everybody here, I didn't mean literally everybody here, Luis. But, uh, <laughs> Man, yeah, yeah, that is that we is. We did a, get lunch. That's true. We did get lunch. Yeah, it, it was good. And you'd probably pay four thousand dollars for lunch. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so th- yeah, that is a generous bounty. I mean, no one here goes home too disappointed. Obviously, anytime you attend a tournament and you don't win the tournament. You know, you're a little sad. It I, is. Y- y- I mean, but other than that, I mean, it's still one of the best tournaments to not win in the history of Magic. <laughs> That's right. All right, so Randy's over in the red zone right now with some replays for us from the other matches during this round. Yeah, I've been watching the match, uh, Lars versus uh, Corey. Let's, uh, we told you about game one, but, I mean, we're running ahead of schedule. we got plenty of time. I want to make sure I show you how the top four actually does get decided. So let's go watch that game one. Lars Dom is playing a black Devotion deck, splashing red, and uh, he's playing against the blue-white Devotion deck, so the blue Devotion deck with Ephara and friends. The, uh, the crazy thing for me about Lars is that we told this story yesterday. He wasn't really done fiddling with this deck list. He discovered the email in his spam folder uh, saying he had to get his list in, so in it came. Life Bane comes down. Desecration Demon comes over. Um, Lars figured, you know, the exact combination of main deck and sideboard cards. I think he was pretty happy with the 75, but what does he start? You know what? He can't do anything wrong this weekend. You look here, he's just crushing. Detention Sphere takes a couple of Lifebane zombies. Doesn't matter. He comes, swings over with the demon. Uh, Frostborn Weird dies to Hero's Downfall, so it can't tap the demon down. And uh, there you go. That's Lars winning game one. Uh, I would, I think, like to show the end of this match before we flip. So... And if you look at Lars, you know, he played two Packrat main, two board, one Sire of Insanity main, one board. I mean, right. th- those are not normal numbers of those cards. No, it's a bunch of twos and threes of things with, like, main deck sideboard. He was kind of fiddling around. So here's game two. Uh, Night Veil Spectre does come down for Corey on, on turn two. And a win for here for Corey would almost clinch it. But Lars just keeps doing favors for everybody else in this tournament. He kills the Night Veil Spectre, attacks with his own Spectre, Picks up a Tidebinder Mage for his trouble. Naked Biden is not going to get the job done for Corey. Uh, Thassa picked up from that Night Veil. Okay, Detention Sphere can kind of blunt things, but here's a replacement Night Veil Spectre. Here's a Master for four. But, yeah, Ultimate Price takes that down. Night Veil Spectre keeps chipping over. Now we're on the Pack Rat plan. The list may look weird. It's twos and threes, but... It has delivered up to Lars exactly what he has needed. He continues. I called him a juggernaut last round. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to call him now. I'm running out of metaphors for the way Lars is just dominating this tournament. And uh, Corey, he's not eliminated by any stretch of the imagination. And honestly, the fact that Lars keeps winning these matches, I think somebody could actually sneak in at 8-6. and six. Like, I'm not convinced that Ansi is completely dead. Wow. You know, maybe. It would have to be, like, one person on tiebreakers, but that might be Ansi. I, uh going to be interesting coming down the road as Lars just runs away and sucks all the wins out of the system. That cut is going to be tight. All right. Thanks, Randy. Wow. So this is actually going to get very interesting down the stretch. I know that we have another match queued up here. Thomas Gleed versus Seth Manfield. So let's bring that one up once we can here. A lot of mana being tapped here. Yeah, and no, we're, we're deep into the revelation phase of the game. Which we is, are. Which is not good news for the people who don't have revelations in their decks. Right. As... Uh, Looks like Jace is being activated here, revealing Revelation. Though uh, It looks like uh, Seth might not be able to take the Revelation here because Elspeth is going to destroy two Desecration Demons, which is pretty uh. tempting. <laughs> it is funny that both of Elspeth's modes actually protect you from de- Desecration Demon. So Seth could actually play Elspeth plus it, feed two demons, feed a soldier to each demon, and then use a soldier to chump the Muta Vault. The only disadvantage, and something that I saw run in... Uh, happened in Cincinnati is Josh Adderlayton's opponent did that, that exact play, th- got his tokens bile-blighted, and just died to jo- Josh's demon. So Seth, Seth's going to play around that. He's just going to minus the Elspeth, kill both demons, and just play it safe. Okay. So right now the situation is this. Seth Manfield is down a game. We're in game number two here. So he's he's back against the wall here, though looking to be in pretty good spot. And that's tough, too, because I, you know just like... And this is even more than the John Monsters deck... When you play against Mono Black Devotion and you and you win game and you lose game one with the Revelation decks, it does not get easier. Game one is the is the game where the Devotion decks have all these dead removal spells, 
And post board games, they just have all duresses and thought seizes instead. Right. Yeah, that game one went shockingly long for uh, for Gleed to win it on the devotion side, but he had three underworld connections running by the end of it. So many cards ahead. <laughs> but uh, it looks like Seth just pref- you know he, his deck's designed for post board games, <laughs> <laughs> and by that I just mean he just happens to be winning the post board game. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of like we uh, we were teasing Pat Cox that uh, White Weenie is a day one deck because he's eight won three GPs in day one and uh-huh. then not done well in day two in any of them, uh. which doesn't actually is, it's not that it's actually not a day one deck. He's just done better on day one. <laughs> I see. I mean, there are decks that aren't top eight decks, but day twos and day ones should be close enough that it shouldn't it shouldn't change yeah, that. There shouldn't be a big difference, right? Looks like two Ashex already got dealt with. With Syncopate and Thoughtseize would be my guess. Syncopate would would exile one. Yeah, Tomas does Here's clinch Tom Four if he wins this. By the way, okay. So this is a this is a winning in for Tomas Gleed here. And and Seth, I mean, obviously you want to win all your matches, but beating beating the pair up is really big. I mean that uh-huh. that gives yeah. Seth the best possible chance of making top four. Yeah, Seth controls his own destiny. Yeah, win win, he's in. Yeah, lose lose win. There's no way he makes it right on tiebreakers. He oh, because his breakers are he, bad. He can't. You can't start at two five and then tiebreak in generally. <laughs> I mean, that is, it is possible, but it is unlikely. Now, how close is Seth to actually winning this game? I mean, it looks like he's in the driver's seat, six cards in hand with Jace on the battlefield versus what's going to be zero <laughs> underworld connections, yeah. one card in hand for Tomash. Uh, he's got, Seth has nine minutes left on his clock. Like, he wants to get the ball rolling pretty quickly and close this, this second game out, right? He does, and uh, <laughs> Nushin Thief hopping oh, into play wow. in response to thoughts he's, uh, or at least trying to hop into play. Yeah, it might get countered here. But, yeah, Seth isn't super close to actually delivering lethal this game, but he's pretty convincingly far ahead, and I don't think Seth's going to time out. I mean, Seth okay. Seth has gotten low on his clock a few times, but, uh, again, six minutes is plenty of time to actually play a game of Magic if you play yeah. fast. But, I mean, this matchup can go pretty long, right? They tend to grind each other down a lot. It's like, you know, Thought sees you, get all the cards out of your hand, and then they're both kind of waiting to get their card engines going you know, whichever one it happens to be, either Sphinx's Revelation or the Underworld Connections, and these games can go pretty long. Yeah, they, I mean, there is the potential to play a, a game that's longer than you expected mm-hmm. and end up, you know, kind of scro- scrambling for time, but I think Seth is in okay shape. I mean, we'll see. Okay. We, we, I don't know how long... The, I mean, this game could take another three minutes off his clock, in which case yeah. he, he could be feeling it a little, but I think if this is a, a Revelation which it looks like it is, then he, he might be in pretty good shape. That's a lot of mana being tapped here. It's also kind of unfortunate for Tomash that the Notion Thief plan has been revealed. It is yes. no longer a secret. When Notion Thief is a secret, it's so much better. Yes. N- now that you know it's kind of public information, Seth, Seth's not going to tap out for Revelation when Tomash has five cards in his hand. Nope, and he did not tap out. And here's Desecration Demon for Tomash. Passes the turn back. And I imagine Seth's going to... You know, be well on his way to finding a kill condition. He only has now is he about to have ten cards left in his deck once he draws for his turn. Yes, but I mean, one Aetherling and this game's over in a flash. And even an Elspeth is is fairly quick here. So he's he's plusing Jace, which means he's got you know all the things he needs. So I think this game should be over fairly quickly. Okay, approaching eight minutes left on the clock. We'll keep an eye on it. Probably won't be an issue. Here's Aetherling. Here's Muta Vaults getting ready to get in the red zone. The, the way is relatively clear. There's only a Muta Vault left over for Tomas Glied, and, and uh, Seth's at 20, so he, he doesn't care about any crackbacks or anything like that. He's just going to battle with both, potentially trade one off here. And it looks like Seth's just going to allow it. Yeah. And that, that Muta Vault hit from Seth doesn't really change the clock or anything, but you might as well, I guess. Okay. He's got nothing better to do. I mean, he's. I assume he's got to dissolve up even if he doesn't. There's not much. There's no one card that Tomash can play that completely destroys Seth, especially since Tomash has no cards in hand. Right, so that's the problem. So normally that Packrat. <laughs> yeah, normally Packrat would seem pretty nice here, but uh, no cards in hand. Tomash has a lot of mana on the battlefield, though. He's got nine, ten mana on the battlefield here. Yeah. Got to wonder if he could have kept one of those. Yeah, stomps, I was just going to huh? say that. Like, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if he could have kept a land or two. At this point, if Seth has a dissolve, this game's just, you know, completely over. If he doesn't, Tomash can, like, draw running removal spells to not die to Aetherling immediately. But still, we're looking at maybe 30 seconds more off Seth's clock at the most. Right. So Seth looks like he's going to be able to close out game two, and we're going to get a game three here. Yep. And it looks like uh, once we go to game three, then, 
you know, Seth's got seven minutes and a little over seven minutes after this game ends, maybe 7.30 actually. So I think that's going to be okay. I don't think that it's, it's going to be terrible, but we'll, we'll have to see. Seth certainly can't waste time. Let's just put it that way. So it looks like Seth does take the game. All right. So Seth Manfield evens things up, and we are going to get a game three here. Now, I, I saw some pretty nice sideboard cards here from Tomash. There's Ashiok, which actually he he's got that main that. deck. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But then also that. Yeah. Notion Thief is, is, is kind of a beating. I mean, unprepared opponents are going to get destroyed by it, but Seth, Seth knows about it now. I don't know if he knows that Tomash has the full four, uh -huh. the quad laser, but, uh, <laughs> you know, he, that, that's what's going on. So Seth's going to have as much removal as he can against them. And he's he's also he's also gonna not run a Sphinx of Revelation out, so Okay. Alright, I'm gonna go bring up our next bring up the next one in case. Welcome back to the booth, guys. Marshall hey, Suckliff here with Luis Scott Vargas. They are finishing up sideboarding, but once they're in, we're gonna be down there. There's one other outstanding match, uh, Paul Nemeth versus Andre Strosky. Yeah, the thing that's at stake there is basically the winner is trying to get to that 21 where maybe they could get to 24 and get a tiebreaker miracle. Unlikely to affect the top four cut, but... Okay. Yeah, and, and even if they do end up missing top They're four... They're coming from I'm, behind, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the top you know top eight and t prizes are still much bigger. Yes, there's big pay jumps in the middle there. We've been looking at the prize payout slide periodically throughout the course of the day. And I mean, 25K up at top 17 for a second, but it, there's some pretty big jumps. It starts off at $4,000 on, on the last slots, and it jumps up pretty quickly. Yeah, you got to so. get to right. ninth to do better than 4K, so that's definitely a nice bubble. There you go. Yeah, fifth through eighth is still, it's still you know, it's a pretty good consolation prize there. Oh, Let's there take a go. look at that right there. So third and fourth get $9,000. Fifth through eighth get 6000 So a $2,000 jump. It doesn't look like that much when you spread it out on the thing, but 2000 bucks. <laughs> it's 2000 bucks. All right, still waiting for the players to start here. There's two matches left. There's Andre Strosky versus Paul Nemeth. There's also Tomasz Gleed versus Seth Manfield. We're going to be watching the Tomasz one. Again, if Tomasz manages to win, he's in. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he has enough wins. He's that playing down. Point, he's, he's, he's locked. Yeah. And Seth's just – Seth, if he wins, he's winning in here. All right. Looks like they are underway, so we can head back down there. Looks like we're in the game here. Yeah. Seth uh, is on six cards. And a thought sees from Tomas Glid is going to be yeah nice start. So whenever your opponent mulligans and you get to thought sees yeah. them, you got to be pretty happy. You force, force mulligan them to five. <laughs> right. You'll notice that these are photographs of our players. That's not Seth's current face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that might be Thomas's current face. Yes. <laughs> All right. So. What I'm assuming is happening is that Tomash is now writing down the contents, and here's Jace Architect of Thought, interestingly hitting the the bin here. Let's go ahead and see if we can uh, take a look. Re so Seth reveals yeah. a second Jace, a Hallowed Fountain, two revelations, and a land. So he has not a lot going on, and wow, there's a pack rat for Tomash Gliad. This I mean, could be a quick game. This could be. I mean, th the pack rat plan is certainly something that Tomash can push here. Now, we know that Seth has a lot of ways to answer a pack rat in his deck. Yeah, I mean, the pack rat plan is at its worst against Esper. Mm -hmm. But but sometimes you, you thought seize them and then play a pack rat and just win the game. Yes, it does still happen. Land, land for Seth. This is where, like, land thought seize for Tomash lead would be quite nasty. It could be, but Seth could very easily... I mean, we still know that Seth has a planes in his hand. His hand right now is planes, two revelations, a Jace, and an unknown card. Oh, he's only got one unknown card. Right. He could have leave us, you know, have left a Supreme Verdict or Detention Spirit on top of his deck. Yeah, we should actually check that. So, Seth did put a card on the bottom, so... Okay. We, we don't know what the top card is. Tomash doesn't know what the top card is. He didn't activate the... He did not make a rat. Uh, I see. Or activate the mutable. So now he's no. got a backup plan. So he's not even going all in here. If Seth no. does have an answer, all right, Tomash has underworld connections. If Seth doesn't have an answer, he's pretty dead. Yes. Revoke existence on the underworld connection. So this does give Seth at least a way to use his mana in a meaningful way for this turn, but those pack rats are looming. And and now Tomash knows the rest of Seth's hand. He knows, you know, yep. planes, two revelations, and a jace from, from the thoughts he's before, which means... Tomash can kind of just go for it. I mean, this puts... So he, yeah. gets, to, he gets to hit Seth now for 10 Four, damage. Eight, 10 damage. Assuming he makes a rat. It's lethal next turn anyway, so you could just not make a rat. And then if Seth draws an answer, great. You know, yes. you, you're still in the game. If Seth doesn't draw an answer, 
then that is it. So All right, here what we go. Seth draw? Wow, supreme <laughs> verdict again. He just always has it right when he needs it. I wish we could get a camera on Seth. Uh, I mean, those might be the current faces. Yeah, now, now we've just updated Tomash, our yeah. shot. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Seth Manfield. He's got to hold on to these uh, supreme verdicts. Like These specific ones are the ones he has to bring to all tournaments going forward. Now, what is Tomash's plan here to rebuild? Well, Desecration Demon is a lethal attacker, so that's a, a, that's a, a good rebuild. Start. Unfortunately, of course, Seth does have. Uh, hey, look, we got a picture of uh, Tomash. He looks a lot more calm. Yeah. Well, if if Seth has an untapped land that doesn't cause him damage, he can Revelation up to nine and take eight. Right. If he doesn't have an untapped land, Jace is, Jace isn't going to do it either. I mean, he's going to take seven uh, or s six off the Muta Vault plus things. He's going right. to have to. I think he's actually dead here. If he's revelationing for two, then, I mean, he's got to play a, a dual end into Dark Betrayal or he's dead. Yes. And he and doesn't. He doesn't. So all Tomash has to do is activate Muta Vault and swing for eight, and he could be in the top four here. That's what it looks like. Wow. So big pressure from Packrat early. Seth Manfield finds an answer, but it's not enough. As Tomash Gliad, it looks like he's in our top four. Yeah, and uh, he, he's looking a little happier now. Yeah, he certainly is. Uh, tough one for Seth Manfield there, but... Uh, he almost had such a good comeback, too. He was 5-0 up until that match today. Yeah. All right, do we have some... Uh, uh, Randy, do we have some red zone replay over there ready to go? Uh, I can queue one up. I think there's one match left going, but uh, I've got a date price special. Okay, great. He said it's sweet. Let's find out if the price continues to be right. Uh, this is a replay of a match that wasn't at the at the top of the standings, but it's uh, it's Ferrand Lee against David Kaufman. Uh, let's see what happens. Let's see if Nate has hooked us up again. Looks like uh, Ferrand on the bottom of the screen is on the Jun Monsters list. He's got the Courser going. Well, he, he's the Naya Monsters with, oh, uh, the, big with, Naya. with the Quad Archangels. <laughs> right, 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 right. Big Naya with the Quad Archangels. And he's playing against uh, Kaufman, who's on uh, Mono Black, I believe. I mean, it's definitely Devotion. I think it's the, the one mono version. One of the monos. Lifebane Zombie, Desecration Demon, Karyatids, Devour Flesh. Wow, he's just picking off everything. Ate the Courser. But here's Elspeth. That holds out a pretty good job of holding off Desecration Demon. Sacks a token to tap the Desecration Demon. Elspeth did die to uh, Hero's Downfall here. Now it's Xenagos from the Big Naya deck. And the second demon. Now that the satyrs and the soldiers versus the demons, who wins in a fight? Seems like the demons eventually beat the satyrs, right? It just takes them a while. It's a gigantic desecration. Three demons. I mean, Xenagos is good against Desecration Demon, but Elspeth is the one that actually gets you ahead. Xenagos does not right. keep up with triple demons. No. Three demons. Ferran's on 27, so he's not... Immediately dead, but it's a lot of giant demons. How about a gray merchant? Whack, take eight. More demons. Now they're they're gonna start getting what through now. What is happening? Right? <laughs> Desecration <laughs> demons keep getting tapped, but he's finally managed to eat through all the tokens off the Elspeth and the Xenagos. Two of them get in and drop for on to eleven. I've never seen Desecration Demon with that many counters on it. Six counters is a lot of counters. Crazy, and that is the match. Wow. wow, Desecration Demons ate <laughs> nine creatures over the course. Ten if you want to count that last carry. That's carrot. insane. <laughs> Desecration Demons demanded tribute, but they got there. All right. Thanks, Randy. We've actually got one more match outstanding here. Uh, down, We're going to bring it to you once we can. We've got Andre Strosky. He's playing against Paul Nemeth, and it looks like an S for Amir. I believe Paul is up a game here. Yeah, and uh, soon we'll be up too. Uh, Marshall's brought us to a game that l I think looks pretty close. Don't blame this on me. Because <laughs> <laughs> Paul has a, has a Jace Architect of Thought. It's on eight counters. Ooh. What, his, what he's going to try to do here is he's going to try to Mutavolt Chump Brimaz. The, the Cat Soldier still doesn't deal damage. Right. The second one does, though. So he's got to have a second removal spell, and then he can keep his Jace big enough to ultimate. looks like he's just devouring a Cat Soldier... And Jace is going down to five. So we have Brimaz versus Jace. This is like some dual deck <laughs> yeah. that we haven't seen yet. <laughs> and it looks like Paul's actually just going to go for a big revelation, just completely tapping out. Uh-oh. Syncopate. 
takes care of that. Well, at this point, Andre still has three cards in hand. Paul still now has six cards in hand. Wait, did it resolve still? Wait, how did that resolve? Paul has 12 cards in hand now. Okay, well. <laughs> so either Andre didn't tap enough. Let's see if we can. Or did Paul do the thing where, have you ever had somebody do that to did you? Did he underpay? Did, were you did underpay? he leave mana floating to beat Syncopate? Oh, wow, I think he did. Did he leave one <laughs> mana That did not available? just happen. <laughs> That is because I've, I've seen people do that to me, and I'm <laughs> like, wait, I see that mana floating there. <laughs> this guy's got all the tricks. He tapped out for he appeared to tap out for syncopate, but had mana floating. We he even waited till his clock paid, right? turned yellow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul's down on time. This 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 match could very plausibly come down to time. I mean, Paul has two blood barons out. Andre's just just uh, resolved his own Sphinx of Revelation. The Elspeth's actually going to kill the blood barons. Brimas dodges Elspeth. Yeah, we've got some w wacky stuff going on here. When both players are hurrying this much, the syncopate trick, I think, is something that's just going to catch people. So, <laughs> Jeez. Rima's fighting Jace. Andre's playing his, his kill condition of choice, which is Elixir. There are a lot of permanents on this battlefield as well. Here's a Thought Seize. And both players have a million cards in hand. So even though even though Paul did resolve that revelation through you know wit and cunning, I don't think he has enough time left on his clock to kill Andre with an Aetherling, and Aetherling might not actually even resolve. It looks like Essence Scatter draws a Gainsay, draws a Dispel, uh. and it looks like Aetherling doesn't resolve. Now Andre has successfully dealt with Aetherling. He's got an Elixir in play. He's got an Elspeth in play. He's got a Bremez. I think Andre is actually winning this game on all fronts. He's ahead. He's not ahead on life exactly, but he's ahead on the board. He's soon about. He's about to be more ahead on the board. He's ahead in cards and library. He can't get decked. And then uh, Paul's got like a solid minute and a half or a minute and twenty seconds left of less clock than Andre does. Wow. You see the pace is, is properly quick here. Here's another thought seize though, for Paul, and looks like that's going to draw a counterspell of some sort. <laughs> it looks like a rebel. Uh, oh, he's going to rev in response. I, I that seems more likely. Yeah, he does. He leaves himself with a bunch of mana left over as well, and a negate to so protect yeah. what's left of his hand. Both players playing very quickly now, given that their clocks are getting low. And here's an Obsidot, though. Andre sitting at thirty six life with a million tokens on the board. It's still going to earn a dissolve. I think he's just dissolving it because he has nothing better to do and he has a million cards in hand. Right. It's not like Obsidot's actually going to win Paul the game there. Right. And here is Detention Sphere to take out Jace. And I think you're right, Luis. Looks like Elspeth and Brimaz are going to take over here. Yeah, I mean, Andre, uh, again, is threatening to kill Paul via lethal damage, threatening to kill Paul via decking, threatening to, get to kill Paul via clock. So Paul's got a lot of ground to make up here. Here's another Jace Architect of Thought, though. That's going to earn a negate, and that's going to free up all of those regular soldiers and cat soldiers to attack here and start putting huge dents in Paul Nemeth's life total. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's 12, 13 damage. So uh, Nemeth drops down to 15 here. Now, Nemeth is up a game. But that doesn't actually matter if he has less time. Right. Since when your clock hits zero, you are done. But the, the, the time gap is, is narrowing. It could be that Paul's really kicking it into overdrive here. He did say he could play fast when the situation demanded it. He and did. He's narrowed that lead to like a little less than a minute. Here's another Jace Architect of Thought, which could buy him multiple turns potentially. Dissolve. I mean, Paul Nemeth is, is at 15, and he's going to take a lot of damage here. So given that Jace is not, is not doing anything, I mean, Jace didn't, didn't resolve, this looks like potentially lethal here. Depends if Paul has another revelation or something. Yeah, well, Paul's still taking the time, though, to activate his Muta Vaults here. So The gap is about 50 seconds on the clocks here. And this could get really weird. I mean, if that still kills him, though, it, it looks like it says Andre wins the match. But oh, we'll Andre wins a match. Okay, so it looks like uh, that wasn't correct that uh, that Paul was up a game and Andre is our winner. That was the last match of the round.
Yep, that was it. So that's going to do it for our penultimate round here. We've got yep. one more round of standard, and then we're going to be setting the top four. So things getting quite exciting here down the stretch at the Magic Online Championship. Um, we're going to be setting up an interview for you in just a moment. We're also going to be getting a, a replay in the red zone from Randy. We're going to maybe try to examine that play that we <laughs> saw a little bit and, and try to get a feel. All right, so I am told interview is ready. L why don't we throw it down to Nate for an interview? All right. Hi, everybody. This is Nate Price. I'm here with Tomasz Gliad. Uh, congratulations. That was a fantastic match that we just watched between you and Seth Manfield. Yeah, it was a pretty tough one. It was very complicated, but uh, and the third game, he mulliganed to six, and I had like a pretty good row, so I get it. I mean, one of the big things that uh, we'd been talking about as far as your deck goes is the decision to run Ashiok over the Night Vale Spectres. It's the reason that they're not very good. I know you've kind of gone over this a little bit, but that decision to pick the Ashiok up was something that worked out incredibly, incredibly well for you so far, hasn't it? Like, especially in that match against Seth. Yeah, I think Ashiok is the most underrated card currently at uh, Standard Meta Game because it's like pretty good against Mono Black uh, and like it's reasonable against uh, any control deck. And it's uh, the new removals are most like Last Breath from the Control and uh, Bablight, and none of them interact with Ashiok. Yeah. <laughs> so if you play it against a Mono Black, it's like only Heroes Downfall. That's only one card. And if they use Heroes Downfall, they had no real good answer for the Demon mm -hmm. because it's they run Bablight, and uh, it's it's pretty good to like have it uh, there and uh, against like Esper is pretty good because it's it's not that great. It has a lock, a uh, pretty slow lock, but they need to use a detention sphere in it for sure. Because it might might even exile like one or two aspect uh, and they left without no win condition because it's exile it, not, uh, not into a graveyard. So don't shuffle it back with uh, Elixir. It worked out pretty well. That first game against Seth looked like it was pretty out of hand for you, and then by the time I came back around to keep an eye on it again, Ashiak had gotten things more or less locked up for you. Um, so why don't you, uh, I think you make, this makes you our second player, we think more or less confirmed for our top four tomorrow. So how does it feel to be uh, like prepped and ready? You see, I know you said you started the day 03, and this was like a nice turnaround for you to be back and actually get more or less clinched with this top four now. <laughs> yeah, I'm just uh, pretty happy about the top four. I expect after a 6-1 to make it, but uh, started with the 0-3 yeah. with like terrible matches like Flood and like just, I think my deck is, was good, but um, just not work out. But uh, I came back on standard and that's what it matters. Yeah. And if you're gonna have, he told me you had faith in your standard deck. If you're gonna have faith in anything going into tomorrow, it's kind of what you want, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. Awesome. Well, uh, it's been great talking to you. I mean, congratulations again. It's fantastic. And uh, no problem. We look forward to continuing to see you do well and uh, hopefully seeing you on the top four stage. So, cool. Then you're welcome. Back to the booth. All right. Thanks, uh, Nate and Tomash. That was nice. So, we are, uh, Randy's <laughs> getting the red zone together. You grew some. <laughs> I looked over and you kind of scared me. I tried, to, I tried to get our producers to give me something to sit on. but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he asked for a phone book. They wouldn't do it. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to throw you to some matches, and when we come back, we're going to have Randy and the red zone to take a look at a kind of interesting play. See you guys in a minute. Experience Magic Online's Cube Draft. You can draft the same cube used in the Magic Online Championship. Check out mtgo.com for information on the events, or find them on Magic Online in the Player Lobby's limited tournament queues. Stay on top of everything happening on Magic Online. Visit mtgo.com for up-to-date information about Magic Online events, as well as upcoming releases. Also be sure to follow at Magic Online and the MTGO hashtag on Twitter. Hey guys, welcome back to the booth here at the Magic Online Championship. Luis Scott Vargas over there, Marshall Seckliff here. We've got Randy in the red zone. He's digging around trying to look for a play. The tournament, however, carries on as uh, we, we've, we've got one more round to go, Luis. Um, a couple of seats seem to be taken already. Lars Dom, uh, Tomas Gliad look like they have their seats locked up for the top four. Yeah, it looks like they, they're they both uh, ready to play standard tomorrow. Two of the Devotion decks, actually, two of the Black Devotion decks locking okay. it up. Interesting. Now, and they like both splashed a color, too. They did, right. That seems to be the thing to do. We've got a, a standings board for you to take a look at as we're taking a look at them ourselves here. So, Lars Dom, Tomasz Gliad, we talked about them a minute ago. They're in. What happens after that? Dmitry Budakov, 8-5. Corey Lack, 
eight and five. So those are the guys that are, are winning in as well, so, right? So right now we've got, we also have pairings too, and Lars Dom is playing Tomasz Gliad. So the winner of that match, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the top four. Okay. Both those guys are, they you know, on easy snack. street. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then Dmitry Budakov is playing against Corey Lack. They're, they're playing a winning in. I mean, the, the winner of that match makes it for sure. But they're not necessarily playing a losing out. Ah. Depending on tiebreakers, and it looks like it actually it looks someone like someone gets in on six losses. Yeah, it period looks like at the end someone gets in at eight six. If 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 Dimitri loses, he actually could still make it. If Corey loses, it Corey d- it cannot make it, it, or at least not without very strange things happening. It looks like basically everyone outside of that match who's a uh, eight, seven and six is rooting against uh, Co- uh, Corey Lack there. Okay, because if Dimitri wins, he's in for sure, but he might be in with a loss. Everyone else wants Dimitri to win, and then, like for example, Antiochio. If Antiochio wins, it looks like he bypasses Corey Lack if Corey Lack is wow, the loser. Wow, interesting. Yeah, and Hannes so Karem also has fighting. very good tiebreakers as well. Yeah, okay. Han- Hannes Karem, and uh, and it looks like Hannes Karem and uh, Antiochio are not playing because even though pairings generally go by breaker, they've already played. Yeah, I see. So they can't. So they're not playing in th- this round. So it's actually kind of a battle between both of them winning, trying to figure out whether they're going to make it on breakers. And uh, it looks like Seth Manfield's going to have a tough time. So it looks like it's mostly Hannes Karem or Ansiakio, but battling for the last slot, though they're in contention with uh, Dmitry Budakov if he loses as well. Okay, so this is going to get interesting. This remember, is a, yeah, complicated breakers here. It, it is, because one of the things that we have to remember is we're playing on Magic Online. There are no intentional draws. You don't get to just say, ah, let's take a draw and see what happens, or we right. can both draw in. They have to play in these last rounds. Yeah, and otherwise, you would see Dmitry and Corey Lack drawing this round. If this was a live tournament, that's yes, what would happen. right, and... Uh, I personally, I like this. Like, I yeah, like, no, this I, is awesome. I mean, yeah. I, I, just having to play around seems fine to me. Yeah, like, <laughs> having to play magic more is, yeah. seems like an okay thing to you. Yeah. Now, so who are we going to be watching this round? Uh, it looks like this round we're going to be watching Corey Lack and Dmitry Budakov. So they're, they're the they're the only match that we know that where the, where the winner is guaranteed in. It could be that the losers in too, but the the winner is guaranteed in. You can see Corey there. He's from, uh, well. He's all business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that based on the picture there. Uh, played a ton of lifetime matches. Had a sweet draft deck earlier with Kiora. And yeah, yeah I, 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 liked, I, liked his, I liked his draft deck. His matches were all pretty epic. Yes, they were. Uh, so great stuff there. Um, do we, I don't actually know what he's playing in standard, I don't think, but we'll find out uh, shortly. Let's take a look at his opponent. Oh, it's Blue Devotion. Yeah, he's the one playing the Blue Devotion with Detention Spheres. Oh, uh, with Detention Spheres. Okay, and here's, again, we've seen him throughout. This is our returning champion, Dmitry Budakov. This guy won last year's Magic Online Championship. He has been playing, he played in Dublin as a result. He also played some GPs. He even top eighted a GP in yeah. Europe. He's really, you know, trying to, to go out there and make a stand. He said, I asked him about an interview. I said, look, you know, you won $25,000. You became the Magic Online Champion. You got to play in the World Championship. Are you using this as like a springboard to try to play a lot more live magic, he's like absolutely, and I think you know if he's able to take down this tournament, he's going to be able to throw another year of, of trying to be a life pro. Yeah, and, and I, I got to admit, I'm actually kind of rooting for Dimitri. His attitude is Robo-Cop. just great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, it'll be really cool. I mean, he he could potentially lose and still and still make it in. So he's in an interesting spot where he's uh, obviously you want to win the match, you yes. want to lock it up. There's no question there, but you you kind of have this like side you know side benefit of like, well, if I lose, I still might make it. So. All right, so it looks like players are ready right now down in the feature match area. This is going to be it. This is a win and in for the top four of this tournament. Players are going to get to come back tomorrow and battle it out for $25,000 and a really big price. Well, let's head down to the feature match area right now.